This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Miss Music Teacher, James C. Smith, and Miranda Janelle. Coming up on DTNS, Microsoft and Adobe are going in on AI imagery. A digital camera community mourns one of its own. And when it comes to flagship devices, what is really the killer spec that we need? This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, March 21st, 2023. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From the suburbs of Atlanta, I'm Terrence Gaines. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chenoweth. Well, Terrence, we're glad to have you with us. Um, I uh, am envious of you being on the other side of the country from me because we're getting a lot of rain uh, here in California. But what's new? Uh, nothing much. Uh, I may have to be muting myself <laughs> because I caught a cold and it's my fault. Totally my fault. Never exercise and then go right outside and do lawn yard mm, work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> been there, been there. Well, it is spring, so perhaps uh, sunnier days are on the horizon for everybody. Uh, meanwhile, let's start with the quick hits. TikTok made changes to its community guidelines, expanding its rules on synthetic and manipulated media. The platform now requires all realistic AI that's generated content to be clearly disclosed, uh, either with an overlaid sticker or within the description, kind of like ads. The rules also explicitly prohibit synthetic media that contains the likeness of a real private figure or a public figure endorsing a product. All right. Uh, Microsoft subsidiary Nuance Communications announced a new application to automatically generate drafts of clinical notes for clinicians after a patient's visit called Dragon Ambient E-Experience Express. That's a big word. (laughs) The app uses the GPT-4 model and generates a draft within seconds of a visit rather than Nuance's previous solution, which took about four hours. I think we'll have some happy clinicians in our audience. Uh, If (laughs) that's you, do let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Google flagged several apps from the Chinese e-commerce company Pin Duo Duo as malware, suspending its official app in the Play Store. Google will use its Google Play Protect feature on Android to block users from installing third-party APKs of these flagged apps and also warn users who already have it installed to remove it or them. You know, there are more than one. Uh, Pin Duo Duo spokesperson denied the speculation and accusation that its app was malicious at all. All right. Apple analyst Ming Chi Kuo reports that the upcoming iPhone 15 with a USB C port will only allow faster charging speeds on Apple certified cables under its made for iPhone program. Currently, the iPhone 14 supports up to 20 watt charging on Lightning, with the iPhone 14 Pro supporting 27 watt charging. That makes sense for Apple to have to use a special cable. Yeah, how proprietary of them. NVIDIA announced its new DGX cloud service at this year's GPU technology conference. The service lets users rent virtual versions of the company's DGX server boxes. Each virtual server will feature eight NVIDIA H100 or A100 GPUs and 640 gigabytes of memory. The virtual service can also be integrated with existing on-site GDX servers using the company's base command software. Pricing starts at a cool $37,000 per month. But again, if you're a company that wants this, you might feel it's well worth it. Kind of a bargain if you're looking at a comparison to something like a physical DGX server, which will run you $200,000. DGX servers are typically used in AI-related workloads, including large language models or LLMs and generative AI. All right, Terrence, let's talk about some layoffs and what they might mean to things that we love. All right. Uh, Yesterday, DTNS covered Amazon performing yet another round of layoffs that have been coming in waves since last November. Sometimes it isn't clear to the outsider what exactly is being cut inside of a company of Amazon size when thousands of people lose their jobs at once. But today we have a direct casualty. After 25 years of detailed reviews of digital cameras and accessories, DP Review is being shut down by Amazon and the entire team has been laid off. Yeah. In fact, this was uh, this was a big, 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 sad conversation we were having uh, in our in our team discord this morning. Uh, Rich Straffolino um, said this is big news, guys. Uh, And yeah, if you're unfamiliar with DP Review, 
Um, you, you likely are if you're one of our listeners. But DP Review has been around forever, at least uh, you know in internet times. It was founded back in 1998 and operated independently for 12 years before it was bought by Amazon back in 2010. At that point, the DP Review team which uh, operated out of England, was relocated to Seattle to be closer to Amazon headquarters. All made sense at the time. Now, since 2010, fewer people buy standalone digital cameras, especially because we've got smartphones that do pretty great things. But for those that do, and there are many people that do, a website like DP Review that goes above and beyond the in-depth is essential and, and welcomed. It's sort of, I guess, like if Wirecutter reviewed every digital camera on the market with exhaustive details on image quality and specs and features and video reviews who love and live and breathe camera gear. But DP Review never really evolved under Amazon. A lot of people wondered, well, how will it get incorporated? Never really did, at least into any overall business model that Amazon put forth in a significant way. Now, Roger, I know you were an enthusiastic um, uh, uh, <laughs> um, eyeball share uh, with uh, DP Review. So why do we think this happened? What went wrong here? I mean, I think, think the biggest one is what you mentioned. Since 2010, uh, at least for the cam uh, Japanese camera manufacturers, the, the sales between 2010 and 2021 dropped 95%, like the number of... of, of uh, shipments that they made. So there is significantly less money in that space than there used to be. And so when they picked up DP Review, and, and DP Review along with uh, Imaging uh, Imaging Resource was one of the big go-to sites back in the early 2000s for anything related to digital cameras, whether it was lenses, accessories, flashes, hot, sh hot shoe adapters, anything. Um, it was really, really good. It was a valuable resource. And was fascinating is when Amazon did buy them, and as you mentioned, they didn't really integrate them in a tightly knit way. The The site still existed as a standalone site, although if you were shopping for digital cameras on the Amazon site, you would see like imaging, or not image, you would see DP Review recommends this camera or this set of cameras. If you're looking, say, at a, a, a mirrorless camera or a digital SLR, it would, it would have these recommendations, but it never really went further than that. Mm, and mm -hmm. I have suspected uh, for a long time. Part of it was just because of the affiliate links that used to come from that site were tremendous. Like they would have ones, not just for Amazon, but for B&H uh, uh, and, and a couple of other uh, online stores that uh, used to get tremendous traffic because they were the go-to site to go mm -hmm. if you wanted to buy a new camera. But before you plunk down five, six, twelve hundred, two thousand dollars on camera gear, you wanted to make sure what you were getting was was good, and there were very few other options out there, and DP Review was so good. So really, I think it's just a, sh a, sh a shift in the fact that the market has dropped, uh, at least for consumer cameras, not so much for, for professional uh, digital photography. Um, and Amazon, it was just like, oh, well, we, we got what we wanted out of them, and we need to cut back since we're already having layoffs. It kind of makes business sense in that way. Um, although I'm sure a lot of camera enthusiasts are probably shedding a tear because it was such a, it was, still is, you have until April, still a great resource if you are in the market for, uh, for camera or camera accessories. Speaking of shedding a tear, I wonder if the employees or the people behind DP Review kind of saw this coming. I mean, we mentioned, you know, everybody going to smartphones, not using digital cameras as much, the site never being fully integrated into Amazon. I wonder if the people were kind of like, all right, any day now, any day now, it's coming. Let me figure out something else. Let me, you know, uh, th let me figure something else out I, because this is coming it, eventually. Yeah, I mean, I I know I don't work at Amazon, never have, and I don't, I don't really know what went on with DP Review specifically, but I just feel like, okay, we had 12 years, uh, tw 13 now, to kind of figure out how to... Let's say Amazon, I type in digital camera for daughter, something like that. I'm going to get a bunch of results, maybe something that DP Review said, this is the camera that you want, and maybe it's at a higher end type thing, but here's why, yada, yada, yada. Maybe that's one of the options, but there will be lots of others because that's Amazon's business, right? And there are lots of reviews, some of which may be helpful, some of which may not be. You know, there's a whole bot thing going on when it comes to reviews on Amazon, uh, which is not unique to the electronics category. 
But to have some sort of like the pro corner type thing for certain categories like digital cameras, you know, which which more and more, I guess you could, I'm not going to call it like a niche market because we're not there yet, but more and more is something where it's like, if you're an enthusiast, this this is still a, um, you know, a, a, a product category that makes a lot of sense to you and specs really matter. But the fact that Amazon didn't do anything with that, you know, it's, uh, you know, you go a year or two with something like that going on, fine. But uh, it almost seems like, and uh, the TechCrunch article um, that talks about the fact that uh, DP Review is, is now gone is, is, sort, is sort of worth it because uh, the, the writer is uh, pretty bummed out about it and just said, I don't even know if Amazon knew that it bought DP Review. That's how much it didn't leverage it in any significant way. And, you know, it, it's weird and kind of crass maybe to mention it, but at the end of the day, if you're buying something and you buy it through Amazon, Amazon's happy, right? You know, well, I don't it, think that's it, crass. I think that's its I, model. I mean, and, 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 you know, what DP Review meant to them was really just another way to kind of funnel people into their store. Sure, yeah. And, and if you they know, kind of get you, lost along the way of products, yeah. what does it matter if they end up buying something? You know, and, and what it means to other people, well, you know, that that's a sad thing. But when it comes down to it, you know, as long as we're making the money and we can cut the f- what they see as fat, you know, things like this is go- or things like this are going to happen. Well, as we mentioned, uh, a lot of folks, myself included, uh, who are camera enthusiasts, definitely photography enthusiasts, but are pretty much just rocking the smartphone day to day these days. Uh, new flagship phones are always kind of exciting when you look at specs. Uh, the latest, Oppo announcing its new flagship phone, the Find X6 Pro, offering 2023 flagship specs. <laughs> that would be this year, including a 3168 by 1440 AMOLED screen, IP68 rating for water and dust, and support for 100 watt wired charging. Also featuring three real rear Hasselblad branded camera sensors, each offering 50 megapixels. Main camera offers a one inch Sony sensor, also includes an ultra wide and a 3x periscope zoom telephoto lens. Shipping in China on May 24th, starting at 6,000 won, which is about 873 US dollars. Sounds like a steal for those sorts of specs. We don't have word on international availability, but uh, one to watch. Uh, Speaking of new features, Google updated the Pixel Watch to add fall detection feature, which will automatically detect hard falls and automatically contact emergency services. Hopefully they have tested the uh, roller coaster thing that the (laughs) Apple Watch went through recently. (laughs) The update also adds the ability to press the watch's crown to see the time even when it's powered off or otherwise out of battery. So we got a new smartphone. We got a we got a Pixel Watch update. Terrence. I know you're an iOS user. I am as well. You're also the co-host of the Snob OS podcast. So uh, you talk about specs a lot. Uh, flagship phones from various companies increasingly have similar specs. You kind of start getting into like, well, for the price, what's better? You know, what's right for me? What ecosystem am I in? And there are specs that are, I think, really important to my life. And there are specs that I go, oh, interesting, but maybe kind of gimmicky. What is your take on when you see something like this, you know, some some new phone that gets uh, rolled out or an update to a uh, wearable, for example, what are the specs that mean the most to you? So, um, yes, you're right. We've been doing uh, a lot of specs when it comes to our own podcast, when especially as it relates to iPhones. But we've started to pare down a lot of the specs where we're not going over all of the specs, because what I've noticed is that people care less about the specs as long as when they go to do something on the device it's just there Mm -hmm. and what i mean by that is like for instance we'll take the uh fall detection feature for google nobody wants to say all right i've got this watch i'm about to go hiking let me turn on my google watch uh fall detection feature let me make sure it's up to date let me make sure i got it all set up make sure i got everything going they just want it to work so Mm -hmm. when it comes to like actually deciding what what they're going to buy or deciding um, do I need this extra feature? I think it's, it's more of does this feature justify the cost that I'm about to use? I'm about to spend for this device, but when they actually get it, they're not actually going through and setting everything and adjusting everything to actually say, okay, I bought this device for this feature. Let me go in and tweak it to work to my specific use case. They just want to know what's there. And they want to say, okay, I spent 
eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve hundred dollars in a lot of cases for this new phone. It's got these new features, but I really don't care that much as long as they just work when I actually use it. So I, that's what I've kind of noticed when mm -hmm. dealing with our own reviews. It's like, yeah, I needed to justify the cost, but I really don't care as long as it just works. You know, I just based on our previous camera discussion, I. <laughs> Besides everything being behind me on my little workbench, I haven't used a DSLR in years, regularly anyway. Um, everything is now baked into the phone. But at the same time, even that has changed. First of all, you know, phone sensors have gotten better, and there's a lot of stuff built into the phone itself. So there's less reliance on, I don't know, cool filter apps. I mean, I've got 30 filter apps on you know in in uh, on my iPhone that I'd never open anymore because I don't really need them because the iPhone does everything itself wasn't always the case um, as as uh, the resolution has gotten better and better with 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 photos and videos um, and we have more options I feel like that's sort of the killer spec now I know a lot of people who don't really take a lot of photos at all um, and don't really care about quality you know there might be some photos taken of the family, you know, during the holidays type thing, but there's not so much emphasis on this. I think where a lot of people, that's where something like the new Oppo phone, the X6 Pro, the Find X6 Pro uh, that I just mentioned, you know, a lot of people are going to say like, for less than a thousand US dollars, that is an amazing camera that you have. That's also your phone. That's also the way you might pay for things and, you know, and this and that, and just, you know, takes up less space. Um, I don't know. I wonder when digital cameras will be like, you know, the vinyl people where, you know, there's a resurgence, <laughs> yes. but it because it's kind of cool rather than necessary. Definitely. And I'll add this real quick is that the, especially in the uh, smartphone market, if you're not an iPhone or you're you're not a, a flagship phone from like say, Samsung or or even Google's Google Pixel line, you really just kind of spam specs because you want to impress potential buyers. Because as, as uh, Terrence said, most people don't really understand what all the specs are, but they know big must be better New, and you, faster. And, and, yeah, mm -hmm. so so yeah. you're 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 just trying to check all the boxes, you know, that people go up to the car dealership and they see, well, this car has like 25 things that are standard feature and this one only has 12. And so you you're trying to play to that value judgment uh for for possible consumers whether or not they might use it right if you're a critical buyer you're like well i don't really need that because I, how often do i take pictures uh but if you're just you know if you're plumping down you know 900 bucks for something uh you want to make sure that you're getting a good value that's right well if you have an idea of what you would like us to talk about on a future show one way to let us know is using our subreddit. It's a great little community over there. Submit stories and vote on others. Get them up to the top so we see them more easily. Dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. All right, Terrence, I hope you're ready to talk about AI because Ugh. it won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I feel that way when I open up my browser in the morning. I'm like, oh, boy, here we go again. Uh, but the hits keep coming. Microsoft announced it began rolling out its Bing image creator to Bing preview testers. This uses OpenAI's Dolly model to generate images directly within Bing chat. And you might say, well, which one? Microsoft didn't say which version of Dolly it's using here, just that it's using the very latest Dolly models. The feature will only be available through Bing's creative mode, coming to Bing's balanced and precise modes in the future, and will roll out to the edge sidebar. That actually confused me a little bit this morning because you have to be over in the creative mode. Each request will generate four images from a prompt, each with a small Bing watermark in the lower left corner. Bing says, we want everyone to know we helped you here. Bing is also getting two new search features, Visual Stories and Knowledge Cards 2.0. The Knowledge Cards used to function like Google's knowledge panels, more or less, but now will include AI-generated infographics and more interactive elements like charts and graphs and timelines. Not to be outdone, we have a new contender in the AI arms race, Adobe announced a beta of Firefly, what the company calls a, quote, family of creative, generative AI models. At launch, this includes two models. One offers text-to-image generation. Another generates stylized text. At launch, Firefly will operate as a standalone web app, but the company plans to integrate the models throughout this creative suite. Adobe said all training data for its models either came from content out of its copyright, was licensed for training, 
or was in the Adobe Stock Library because, of course, they want to make sure that people know they are not stealing artists, uh, uh, not stealing their their work because that's been a big deal when AI first started popping out. Yeah, no kidding. And yeah, if, if you're an artist saying, you know, at what Adobe is claiming is either not true or not good enough for me, please do let us know because um, that's interesting. I am so I, I am an Adobe user. I fire up Photoshop a mm, couple times a month to do this or that. I am not well skilled um, at all, and I'm not really using much more of Adobe's um, creative uh, suite. But when I do, I kind of know how to do what I know how to do, and everything else is either start Googling um, or ask somebody who's better at this than I am. Both tend to you know, you know um, surface results that I'm looking for, but it's time consuming and a little cumbersome. And to have anything, especially for yeah, like stylized text or you know, st at least give me an image that I can start playing with, you know, rather than you know to build all these layers myself. That's awesome. I I mean I see nothing wrong with this uh, as far as somebody who's kind of more of a tinker than an expert. If you're more of an expert. I can see where you kind of go like, eh, all right, well, you know, now, now where are we going to get with, you know, all these folks who don't really know what we're, they're doing, you know, they, they didn't go to, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, at enough classes, you know, in, uh, in graphic art to, you know, to, to have these sorts of tools, it's kind of the same conversation that we've been having for a while is, you know, are these tools good for the folks who need the help or do they end up hurting the folks who are better at it in the first place? Well, back in the day, um, I used to be a blogger. Of course, blogging was the big thing. And don't go look at my old yeah. blog posts. Also a skill. But I'm pretty I'm pretty sure, yeah, but I'm pretty sure I copyrighted some images as a thumbnail for my blog post. So I could definitely see, you know, Firefly, something like this coming in place to where I don't really want to get into the habit of or I really don't have the time to create a whole uh, image for this blog post that I just wrote or to make it relevant to today. Let's say I'm a YouTuber and I went all through all this effort to shoot the video, edit the video, add all these things. Now I gotta go and make a thumbnail. I can see people be, all right, give me a picture of a llama, like you said, with sunglasses and that's my thumbnail. You know, I could definitely see that happening to where it's like, I don't have to put a lot of thought in it, but I need it to where nobody can say, hey, you stole my picture, you know, but I can do it real fast. Yeah. And I, I'll add, like, if you're if you're in a multidisciplinary setting, say, like, you're making motion graphics or you're doing a video and you need to make the title sequence, you need to make the bumpers and all that. Oftentimes, you kind of have to start from scratch. You got to generate, you know, in After Effects, you got to make your shapes or you, you pull in assets from Photoshop. And if you pull in an asset, oftentimes you're not going to have a vector image. You're going to have a raster image. And so if you try stretching it or, or, or resizing, it's going to look weird. I think this will allow people to essentially just build and create and basically simplify a lot of the, the initial setup work to to building whatever they need to do, whether it's a larger composition or a, a larger uh, piece of finished work, because oftentimes it's like looking for a tool when you're you're working on your car. It's like, where's that screwdriver? Where's that socket wrench mm -hmm. that I need that one specific size for that I don't have? And then you try to figure out something with what you do have. This, I think, will, will simplify that product. This will also, I think, help a lot of individual contractors who might not have the, the budget to maybe hire a few more people to help them with the project and they have to do it all solo. This, I could see being a very, very valuable uh, tool. That's a good, that's, that was kind of what I was getting at. Uh, you know, in the past, I've had people say, hey, we want to hire you for this freelance project. Can you do this? My answer is yes, I can. Yeah, Where of course it in is. my mind, I'm like, I don't know how to do this, but I know who does, <laughs> and I'll work it out with them. You know, kind of thing. You know, because you want work. For me to say, yeah, I don't know how to do it, but I can figure it out with you know a bunch of built-in tools. You know, so it's more of me just kind of having some fun within menus rather than farming out uh, actual work to, to to other humans. The other humans that wanted my work maybe aren't so excited about this, but uh, but yeah, th this does streamline a lot of things. I think that's that's sort of the takeaway. So thank you, Microsoft. Thank you, Adobe. And thank you to all companies who give us AI stories every day because like an atmospheric river, it never seems to end. <laughs> no time soon, anyway.
Uh, well, hopefully you're not underwater. Uh, and if you're not, you might be excited that Acer, Acer the PC maker, is hitting the road. Yep, they announced their new e-bike called the E-Bi, E-B-I-I. 35-pound bike, so pretty light, offering a 250-watt front-spoke motor with a top assisted speed of 15 miles per hour and a 68-mile range. Go kind of far on this thing. Acer says that the bike will adapt to a rider's preferred level of assistance and riding conditions over time, so it wants to get to know you. Forthcoming companion app for the bike will do proximity-based locking, GPS positioning, some fun stuff like that. And it is from Acer, after all, so the bike's removable 460-watt battery can be used as a giant USB-C battery if you so choose. We don't know anything about price yet or availability, but uh, Terrence, it sounds kind of good to me. Uh, it does. Um, I was trying to figure out what's my use case or could I use this? And not me personally, but my kids. I I have uh, junior high and high school age children and their schools are like literally right around the corner. And I dread every morning having to fight traffic just for a five minute ride. So um, Acer may be getting my money if this is a uh, price right so I can get my kids their own wills <laughs> until they are begging me to use my own, which I'm not looking forward to that at all. I also love, and I know Acer's not, you know, the first company to do this, but also saying like, and when you're not using your bike, this is a great battery <laughs> for all your computing needs, you know, charge your house. That's, it's a per, that's a pretty smart play if you think about it. Yeah. I mean, Acer's traditionally known for PC, PC laptops, PC accessories. You know, that, that market's like the digital camera market slimming down a little bit. What better way to kind of segue into a different market than the e-bikes, which is, you know, on the uptick, as mm -hmm. uh, Rich Trofolino would, would tell you. Yes. Uh, and, and Rich loves have, his bikes. And selling it not only as a means of transportation, but additional power, you know, even, even when you're not riding it, it's still useful. Indeed. All right. Got a couple mailbags. Let's check them out now. This one comes from John and Terrence. If this doesn't make sense to you, I'll, I'll try to clarify. We were talking about the idea of having, um, well, n we're not going to make it up, but the idea of some experts saying we need a single lunar time zone. So, you know, various companies, various governments, people going to the International Space Station, got to talk to each other. What are we doing up there? Let's have one singular time zone, but that's kind of an issue because the moon doesn't have the same, you know, d number of hours in the day that Earth does, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, John says, that discussion reminded me that way back when Swatch, yes, the watchmaker, had this idea that the whole world would use internet time, dividing a day into 1,000 time units. For example, a new time unit would be called a beat. Instead of dividing the virtual and real day into 24 hours and 60 minutes per hour, the internet time system proposed by Swatch divided the day into 1,000 beats. Each beat is a minute and 26.4 seconds. There was a new meridian. Internet time would be based on a new meridian, opposed to the Greenwich meridian, for example. The new meridian going through the Swatch's office in Beale, Switzerland, called the BMT meridian. The BMT would be the reference for internet time. So you've got Beale mean time, or BMT, Another invention of Swatch, linking up to the Central European Winter or Standard Time, which is UTC plus one hour, when it's midnight in BMT, the internet time is 000 beats, and noon is 500 beats. Terrence, there will be tests later. Did you catch all of that? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> so, so wait, so, so do all these roll into one time zone, or is it the, these yeah, are the, different examples? The of, idea is is that the Earth would all operate on a time zone that is that is I don't know more time focused than what we've all just gotten used to. Instead of having a bunch of time zones, we would all use this time zone, but instead of having hours and minutes per day, it would be, be beats. beats. Yeah. I guess my question is, if it's just one zone, do we need to call it a zone? Well, it would, and, yeah, I mean, it's mean time at that point, I suppose. It would just, it, it would just be time, wouldn't it? Would it it be, would be time, I'm, yes. Time uh, relative to where you are, but it's always the same time. Yeah. Is your four o'clock dark? Mine might be. I, there would be, I think there would be a, a, a lot of friction over choosing what the new meridian would be. And yeah. I see, I see, I mean, the rest of it sounds sort of useful, although because it's not all, it's not an inter, 
the 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 seconds aren't a, an actual integer, but you know a fraction of one. Right. Uh, it might get kind of confusing for people who are converting. But really, the sticking point would be the meridian. Who gets to be the meridian? Right. Well, be- Swatch said where our headquarters <laughs> is. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I mean, of course, you'd you'd have to buy into that in order for anything like this to work. But um, I, and I used to have several Swatch watches. In fact, remember the sniffy bands back in the day? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> they didn't they didn't last forever. But uh, yes, John, thank you for bringing it to our attention, and um, you know maybe being nostalgic for anybody who says, oh yeah, I remember that whole Swatch idea. What a fun gimmick and spec. Um, well, someone who isn't a gimmick is you, Terrence Dan- uh, Gaines. So thanks for being with us today. Let folks know where they can keep with up with everything that you are working on. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. You can find me, um, like we mentioned earlier in the show, uh, me and my co-host, Anika Monford. We do an in-depth of all things Apple at the snobOSCast.com. We talk about Apple. We talk about a little bit of tech and some uh, cultural things that interest us. In addition to that, myself, Rob Dunwood, who's been on the show multiple times, and Stephanie Humphreys, we do The Tech John, which is a, a tech show from our read, uh, Black uh, perspective. So definitely check that out. And we definitely appreciate all the viewers, all the people who've came from DTNS and vice versa. We definitely want to say thank you for that. Well, thank you for being with us. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. We also have another thank you to give out, and that is to our brand new boss named Mark. Mark just started backing us on Patreon. We see you, Mark, and we thank you. Speaking of patrons, stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. We roll right into it when DTNS wraps up. We're going to talk a little bit more about NVIDIA's AI announcements, and I might talk a little bit more about scratch and sniff watch bands. Uh, But just a reminder, we do this show live, and you can catch it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern at 2000 UTC. Those are the time zones we're using, at least for now. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow doing it all again with Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. Take it easy. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>